this is the instron right here. Uh, a couple of terminology things that you should be aware of. This across the top here, this is called the crosshead. This is what provides most of the power to the mechanical movement of the instron. Just below it is our 50 kN load cell uh, or load transducer. This is uh, the detector for the load or the strength, uh, the force that we are putting on your sample. The 50 kN right here is our built-in transducer. It's the, uh, the one that stays in the machine pretty much all the time. We do have a 1 kN transducer, um, which I will show you shortly. It, it came from a different Instron model, so it is compatible with Instron. It plugs in and reads properly. However, it does not attach directly to the crosshead. There is actually a little attachment on the top. Well, it's not little. There's an attachment at the top of the 1 kN cell that actually attaches directly to the 50 kN cell rather than attaching directly to the crosshead. We also have some physical stops. There's one here in yellow and then one all the way up at the top of the instrument as well. These provide a safety if the crosshead travels too low or too high, and they are readjustable. If the crosshead travels too low or too high, it will trip these sensors, which will come down into here and activate an emergency stop. On the emergency stop electronics are inside of this section of the machine right here. There's also an emergency stop button, which you can press. If there are ever any issues, um, it's going in a direction it shouldn't, there is a person in the way of the movement, any sort of hazard that can be associated with a mechanical moving piece, this right here is the emergency stop button. To release the emergency stop once it has been pushed, you rotate in the direction of the arrows and the button will pop back up. We also have right here a console, which when the software is turned on, will tell you information like what the crosshead location is and what the load cell is reading, the load on your sample. This is also how we control the movement of the crosshead, to move it up or down as we need to attach different, um, different accessories or fixtures onto the machine itself. Once we start up the software, this will be useful. Um, when the software is closed, you can see like the up and down arrows are not going to do anything, and obviously you can't start a test while the software is off. Also on the machine here, we've got these two um, holes, basically. That's where we're going to attach our fixtures. Um, Instron is very friendly as far as fixtures. You can attach pretty much anything that fits well in there. Um, you want to make sure that your fixture is rated to higher than your sample. For example, if your sample breaks at 1,000 newtons, you want to make sure that your fixture does not break at 500 newtons. You want to make sure that it's stronger than your sample. Um, but we have had people machine or create their own fixtures and bring them in to use here. All of the fixtures, and I will show you this shortly, attach using these clevis pins and clevis clips. Let me grab just one of those. So these pins go through the holes in um, the base or the load cell, and they also go through whatever attachment has been placed inside of this hole. So that just holds those in place. These should pretty much always be located here on the front panel of the Instron. This is the white cabinet located just behind the Instron. Um, we have several shelves here. These two here in the middle, right about head height and shoulder height, are going to be the most useful. The top shelf up here has manuals as well as a catalog of accessories that Instron sells. If your group is looking for something that is ASTM rated or a very common testing method, you can purchase accessories from Instron. If you are interested in purchasing accessories for a project, and then not, you don't want to own them for the rest of forever, talk to the lab manager. We may be able to work out a deal of um, splitting the payment on purchasing a new accessory. Um, we've got a couple of Instron specific accessories. Those, most of those are held on this cabinet here about head height. The most commonly used are going to be our compression platens, which are here, and our tension grips, which are here. Um, these sit in their original uh, padding. 
These other two in the middle, this right here is a three-point bend fixture, as you can see, used for um, flexure testing. And then up here, this is another tension grip right here. This is specific, specifically for elastomers. So this one on the top, uh, these roller grips, they are specifically, they're a good example of a fixture that we purchased with a, uh, with a research group. Um, they've left them here for storage and for use, um, but they do belong to that other research group. So these four items are our most commonly used in Strawn original pieces. Um, pulling any of them out, it's fairly easy to see what they do and how they attach. I will show you an example of how to attach something in a moment, uh, most likely our, uh, our flexure grips. The next uh, setting, or the next shelf down, we've got some pieces that are either Instron specific, but they're broken or missing pieces, or we also have uh, some homemade machined grips and fixtures as well. Starting just kind of from the left in the back, this right here is an extensometer. That is a secondary, in the black case, that is a secondary way to measure the distance that a sample goes. This is most commonly used for dog bone testing if you have polymers. Next to it is a deflectometer that can be used in conjunction with the extensometer and with the three-point bend fixture. The blue piece here in the back is an old Instron piece. It's not something that they make exactly like this anymore, but um, we've got the kind of older version of it. This is for puncture testing of films. Uh, most specifically, that would be for like uh, a polymer film, like a plastic wrap or a cling wrap. Um, and it's got a big long rod that pushes through your film there. These four uh, clear bins right here are all labeled with what they do. We've got a homemade three and four point bend fixture, top left. Bottom left is Vickers and Noop Hardness. Top right is something called a cord capstan grip. Uh, which is for testing rope or string. Um, it could do wire as well. The cord capstan grips are missing a couple of pieces to them. They would just need a little bit of hardware to get back up and working. And then the bottom right is metal coupon testers for tensile testing uh, if you have threaded metal dog bones. Up here in the front, we've got a couple of homemade tension grips. So these hold on to your sample as you pull on it. These could also be used for creep testing or for compression testing. Um, they just hold on to your sample. You kind of grip them down with these, uh, these pieces here. This is the one kilonewton cell. The one kilonewton cell is extremely heavy. Uh, please do not underestimate the weight of this cell. If this were to drop, it would break um, and you would be charged with the fixing or the repair, um, the one kilonewton is really not a lot of force. So this is a lot better for very low force applications, such as uh, polymers that are fairly um, soft or things that are not going up to very high um, forces. Um, so this is going to be a lot more sensitive than our 50 kilonewton. To attach it, you just attach it just like any of our other fixtures up to the top of the machine. But you can see this one has a cord. None of the rest of our fixtures have a cord. This cord transmits the data collected from the actual detector into the machine. Um, when you plug in the one kilonewton cell, you can look toward the back of the Instron. You will see where the 50 kilonewton cell is attached. You just detach the 50 kilonewton cell and install the one kilonewton cell uh, plug instead. Um, like I mentioned, this is very heavy. If you are uncertain about changing it out, please talk to staff and have them assist you with your first or second time installing this um, to make sure that you're not going to damage it and accidentally incur the costs of that. We also have two pieces. They usually sit here on the left side of this shelf. These are adapters. Um, so you will notice the top of our one kilonewton cell has this kind of big post right here. This post fits really nicely into the, 50, the bottom of the 50 kilonewton cell. At the bottom of our one kilonewton cell though, we have a much smaller little female end here. 
And this piece right here is a, uh, it's meant for more delicate fixtures. Um, things like uh, very, very, um, I guess very delicate grips, things that would break if they were put under too much pressure, um, those will typically fit into here. However, there are times when we want to convert between big and small or small and big. That's what these are for. So this darker black one here, this fits into the one kilonewton cell and allows us to attach larger fixtures. You'll notice in writing on here that this has a maximum load of 10 kilonewtons, meaning you should not go up to a full 50 kilonewtons if you are attaching, if you are converting um, between things. This one has the same limit, but it goes the opposite direction. It goes from the large attachment, like on the 50 kilonewton cell, and it goes down to the smaller female attachment. Again, this holder right here uh, has a maximum load of 10 kilonewtons. So with both of these, you are limited to 10 kilonewtons at the most. When you create a chain of attachments um, using these uh, adapters or using the one kilonewton cell or using any one of these, especially these ones down here, um, you want to be absolutely certain that you know what the maximum load is that those fixtures can handle. Um, you want to work with the weakest chain or the weakest link in the chain. So let's say you've got the 50 kilonewton load cell, you've got this adapter which is rated to 10 kilonewtons, and then you've got um, maybe that back piece which uh, I believe is rated up to 15 to 20 kilonewtons. This would be your limiting factor. So you'd want to make sure that you never get close to 10 kilonewtons. You'd want to make sure that you stop any testing before 9 kilonewtons to make sure that you don't accidentally damage or, uh, you know, bend or break this. Um, so when you're, when you're stacking fixtures with adapters and the load cells, you want to make sure that you know what your weakest link is. The other shelves down lower are just sort of a bunch of random hardware. Some of it can be used for the Instrum, some of it cannot. Um, like I said, the Instrum is very friendly to homemade materials. And actually in the back of the catalogs up at the top, it will give you the precise measurements needed in order to fit properly into the 50 kilonewton load cell. So there are schematics and drawings of what these kind of attachment pieces look like, both this side and that side. Um, so you're welcome to machine your own pieces. You're also welcome to kind of rig together your own bits. Um, make sure, like I said, that you know what your weakest link is. Not all of these are labeled to what they can handle as far as uh, force and load. Use your best judgment and err always on the safe side. In a note with that is whenever you're using the Instron, you should be wearing safety goggles. Safety goggles are located on the front desk in the front room where you entered the MCL. These are what are called wedge action tension grips. So wedge action means that actually as it puts tension on your sample, it pulls a little bit tighter. These are meant for dog bone shaped materials um, and they can go all the way up to a 50 kilonewton maximum load. So we have used these also on metal dog bones as well. Um, we brought these both down out of the upper of the two useful shelves. And you can see this has an attachment that fits nicely to the 50 kilonewton cell. So we'd want to attach this to the 50 kilonewton. If you are absolutely set on using the 1 kilonewton cell for a little bit more resolved, low, uh, low load applications, you would need to use an adapter between this and the 1 kilonewton cell in order to attach it. Pretty much all of our attachments attach the same way. You just want to make sure that you have the right ends attaching to the correct other ends. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these to show you just sort of the, uh, the principle of how these attach. So we're going to pull this out of its holder. And I'm going to put this one on the bottom. There is no real right and wrong for height on or for like up and down on these ones. But there is text right here 
that it would be upside down if I put this on the top part and the other one's placard is upside down. So I just like to pay attention to the upright text. Like I said, it does not make any functional difference. It's just aesthetics, I guess. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this end and I'm gonna place it down in the hole there. And I'm gonna bring my face down to uh, kind of the level down here. And I'm gonna rotate this. And what you should see is kind of, we go in and out of where that fits. So I'm gonna take one of the large clevis pins and I'm gonna stick that through. And I'm probably gonna to have to wiggle and I might even need to lift up on the fixture itself. So I'm gonna lift up and wiggle just a little bit while pushing on the clevis pin. There we go. Until that slides all the way through. And if you bring your head around to the side, you can see in the back and in the front, we've got, um, we've got the pin going all the way through, kind of equally centered between the two sides there. Now this is pretty sturdy, but to make sure that, that doesn't slide out, I'm gonna put a clevis clip on here and it's gonna clip over just that spot between the rougher surface and the solid surface. And I'm gonna do that on both the front and the back. And then the last thing to attach is I'm gonna take this black piece that rotates. On a lot of our fixtures, it's actually silver, but there's always a, a threaded rotating piece between the base of the instrument and the beginning of the fixture. So I'm gonna take this rotating piece and I'm gonna rotate it downward up against the, uh, the base of the instrument. When I'm attaching this up on the top, I'm going to tighten this up against the top of the instrument. So what this does is this provides just a little bit of tension between my grip and the machine base or between my grip and the load cell as you know the location depends. And by tightening this, that provides just a little bit of tension between them to keep everything from wiggling. So this pin is not going to wiggle up and down. It's going to stay pretty solid. This fixture right here, you can see it rotates, but it's not wiggling. When this is very loose, I'm gonna loosen that, you'll see there's quite a bit of wobble in this. And that wobble is going to uh, create noise in your extension measurements. It can also create noise in your load measurements. But by tightening this down, we don't get that wobble in there. If you are noticing over the course of several tests, this starts to loosen, which is often the case. We do have this little rod right, whoop, this dark rod right here. Uh, it's just a metal rod that kind of sits on the front of the instrument here. Um, what you can do is put that into the hole and tighten these up just a little bit. So that gives you just a little bit of leverage to tighten this down even more, minimize the wiggle, and that helps it last a little bit longer to keep it from getting loose over time. So I'm going to install the top fixture, making sure that I put it in, well, the order is, I put it in, I put the pin in, I put the clip over the pin, and then I'm going to rotate on this fixture. It will be this piece right here. I'm gonna rotate that upwards against the machine to minimize the wobble. So I'll do that in just a moment. I now have both of my fixtures attached. Um, both of them have been screwed, this one upward, this one downward, so that we're not getting wiggle in those. So they're nicely aligned here. That is the nice thing about getting things directly from Instron or things that are professionally made is that they line up nicely. There are sometimes issues with uh, homemade attachments that don't line up quite as well. Um, but as soon as we've got our two attachments uh, put together, we're first gonna double check that the machine is turned on. Um, you can see we've got our green light right now, so the machine is turned on. If you need to turn on the machine, the power button is right behind the computer tower toward the back in that back corner there. So right next to that power cord is the on-off switch you can see right there. So I'm gonna make sure that's turned on. Once I have this window right here and these lights are stable, I'm gonna come over to the computer and I'm gonna turn on the software just for, uh, to give us power to the instrument to move it around. Our software is called Blue Hill Universal. 
The other icon on the desktop called Blue Hill Universal is actually the help menu. If you have any questions, Instron's help menu is incredible. There's all sorts of information in there. Um, and that'll help you kind of get wherever you need to go or answer any questions that you might have. So you'll notice that that actually changed the screen on our console. Now instead of the Instron logo, we've got the displacement and the force that are being read by our crosshead and our uh, load cell, uh, you know, each. <laughs> and now we have the ability to move the machine up and down using these fast jog buttons. There's also the find position. What I'm gonna do, very first thing before I've started anything, but right after I've attached my fixtures, is I'm gonna move the machine, and I'm gonna move it so that the fixtures are very close to one another, but not touching. So when I get close like this, I'm going to use the find position knob to move those just very gently because I really don't want to accidentally crash them into each other. But I'm gonna get them really close like this. This is closer than I should go in any test. Like I mentioned, these particular grips do not work in compression. They only work in tension. But um, this is the closest I would ever want them to be in a test. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my emergency stop now to this position. So I'm gonna set it just underneath this piece hanging off of my crosshead. And what that's gonna do is if for some reason my crosshead starts moving downward, it will trigger an emergency stop before my fixtures run into each other. Now, these are extremely strong fixtures and this is a very high rated load cell. So there's very little damage that the machine could do to itself with this particular uh, setup. However, there are a lot of setups where if it was going fast enough um, with the right, you know, the perfect storm of things, it could crush itself or crush its own fixtures. So you want to make sure that you set this lower stop to the closest that you want to allow these to move. Now that we have our hardware all set up the way we want it to, we're going to go into the software and set up our method. This is the software. As long as the Instron is turned on, this is the screen that you'll be brought to in the software. If the Instron is turned off, you can get into the software using a, uh, a disconnected or an offline kind of mode. Um, it will not give you as many options in the offline mode, but it is possible to do. Um, there isn't a lot to do in the software unless you're connected to the instrument, other than maybe exporting data that you didn't export previously. Um, but most of this software's purpose is to control the machine and to run samples in the machine. Um, a couple of definitions, there, there are a couple of definitions that are kind of particular to Instron, where there isn't a lot of, well, typically we say things in a different way than Instron says them. So this one, not too weird. There is a difference between method and test. So a method is a bunch of parameters with no data associated. A test is a method as it applies to a set of uh, things to test. So a test has data associated with it. Um, you've broken or stretched or squished whatever your sample is, where a method is really only parameters. So we're gonna start in method here. We're gonna set up our method and then we'll come back to the home page and we're gonna to go to test, and then we're gonna test our samples um, using method. Um, this screen is separated into two here. The first bit here is new method, and these are templates for normal methods that we typically use. At the bottom, you can see methods that have been created recently. Uh, so these are methods that exist um, that other clients have created and named. If you have recently made a method, you can find it down here or click Browse Methods, which will allow you to make changes to or even just look at the parameters within your method. If you're starting from scratch, you're gonna come up here to New Method. A quick explanation of each of these to the best of our knowledge. 
tension method um, is going to pull the sample until you tell it to stop pulling on the sample, typically to failure. Um, tension has the positive direction upward. Tension creep slash relax method, that is going to pull the specimen up to a certain tension and then will hold that tension for a certain length of time. And you can see how force or extension change over time with that force being applied. Compression method is um, you push on the sample until you tell it to stop. The difference between tension and compression is that tension has positive being upward. So if the crosshead is moving up, it is moving in a positive direction. <clears throat> in compression, if the crosshead is moving down, it is considered to be moving in a positive direction. So that's really the only difference between tension and compression, is which way is positive and negative force uh, and movement. <clears throat> compression creep relax, that is going to put pressure or compression onto a sample up until a certain location or a certain position or force, and then it's going to hold it there and monitor changes over time, just like the tension. Again, this has negative or that has, this has positive values being downward. A flexure method is going to be a three or four point bend. Um, flexure is similar to compression where downward is considered positive. Um, it just has different sample setups and different calculations that you can do on your sample based on the information that you put in. So that's the difference between flexure and compression. And then flexure creep relax, that's going to be putting flexure onto something and monitoring it over time to see how force and extension might change over time. A metals method, uh, this is a very specific, uh, it's related to a couple of ASTMs that are specific to testing metals. Um, if you want more information about this, you can click the little I in the corner. This will tell you the kind of information um, this says includes control parameters and calculations for conducting metals tensile testing for global industry standards. So this is related to several standards for basically tension testing of metals. Peel, tear, and friction tests, those are going to be similar to a tension method um, where it goes upward with your sample. This is going to give you the option to figure out different um, equations and calculations or to use different equations and calculations depending on um, whether you're doing peel, tear, or friction methods. We don't have a friction setup in the lab, um, but they are fairly straightforward setups. We have done peel and tear tests fairly frequently. These last two, test profiler. We've got a tension test profiler and a compression test profiler. These two are as close to a custom test as you can get. All of these other tests come with a lot of uh, kind of template kind of assumptions about what you want to do with your sample. These test profiler methods allow you to get as complex as you would like. For example, if you want to pull to a certain force and then cycle it back and forth between two different extensions and then hold it and watch it creep or relax over a period of time. That would be a test profiler because there are several different steps that don't really fit well within these other options. Tension and compression test profiler methods are nearly the same except that they are opposites in the signs that they use. So this one up is positive, this one down is positive, uh, and that's the only difference between those test profilers. Since our most common methods are tension and compression, I'm going to work within a tension method. Also because I am using grips that are only used for tension, I obviously can't do something like a compression method. Um, However, all of these are fairly easy to figure out, and a lot of the principles that I go over in the tension method are going to apply to the others. Like I mentioned earlier, the help options in this are really stellar. If at any point in the software you have questions, you can come up to the top right corner and click this question mark button right here. That'll give you information about the page that you are currently on. It'll also give you information about um, pretty much anything else. You can type keywords in to search through the uh, the help menu. So it's a really great help menu. I'm going to open up a default tension method and we are going to go through kind of start to finish creating this tension method. I have got open here that tension method. 
this is a very, very powerful software. It's used um, by all sorts of industries for all sorts of applications. It's very customizable, which is wonderful for a lab like ours where we get research projects that kind of come in and go. Um, you might have two samples to run, you might have 200. Um, it's a very versatile machine and it can run nearly anything. The con to that, the pro obviously is that it can apply to your research in pretty much any way. The con to that is that it makes the software pretty in depth. There are a lot of options, a lot of things that you can choose from. Most clients don't need to mess with the entirety of the software. I am going to go start to finish through the entirety so that you know where to find things if ever you find ways that you can customize this software a little better to yourself. Now remember, we are in method mode, meaning there is no testing at this point. We are simply creating parameters and setting up the test screen to what we want it to look like when we actually do get to testing our, um, our items. This first one is just kind of general. Um, we are doing a tension test. You can't change that because we are in the tension test method. Um, system of units. SI, metric, and US customary are the most common groupings. If you choose all, that means that I can choose to measure in inches and newtons at the same time. Um, this is really great if you have a wide audience where you want to export one report that is mostly in metric and another report which is mostly in US customary. You have the ability to create both within the same method. Uh, most of our users will use SI, um, however, a lot of our industry users tend to prefer US customary. Um, that is up to you um, to choose. And then assign specimen parameters. So this is another thing that, uh, as far as definitions, is a little unique to Instron. A specimen is an individual. If you have a group of 10 things that you want to test, you have 10 specimens. The group of 10 is called a sample. So you have one sample of 10 specimens. It's really important to keep the difference between specimen and sample clear when you are working with creating a method. Um, it can be really easy to think that you are putting in a sample, uh, an informa information for an individual thing because we typically call that a sample. Um, that is different in this software and you want to make sure that you specify specimen versus sample. An individual specimen versus a group, a sample. So assign specimen parameters from. This is saying when we are working with an individual, how does it apply, assign the next parameters? Parameters for a specimen could be things like its size, uh, its naming convention, any notes about it. So you can assign the parameters from the last specimen that you tested or the method default. I would recommend the method default um, because we'll go through and just create, um, that's what we're doing right now is we're going to create what the method default is or what that means. You also can put a description in method description. This is not necessary and does not show up in a lot of places, but it's there if you would like it. We're going to go along the top here. Our next bunch is sample information. Remember that sample means group and this little icon is very helpful in uh, identifying that. So what we are doing, like I said, is we are setting up the method defaults. Um, if you want to put in a default description for your sample group, you can type that in here. We have four options that we can put in on the sample. We've got notes which is going to be a long text input, number inputs, which is going to be numbers, text input, which is going to be a short text input, something like a couple of words as opposed to maybe a paragraph in notes, and then choice inputs. All of these are going to be, when we get to the test screen, we have the option to have these uh, display themselves or offer themselves to us when we're testing our individual specimens. So if I am creating this method and I would like I would like this method to apply to a set of a certain number of samples 
and I know that every sample is either going to be dry or wet. I can put sample choice input. I can come over here to the pencil and I can add a couple of choices. So I've got one that is dry and one that is wet. And I don't want my operator to be able to, to allow one as a choice. So it's going to be either dry or wet. When I close this, now I've got a sample choice input that is a drop down menu called dry or wet. I can create up to 10 of these drop down menus so that I don't have to type in every time that this group of samples is, this group of specimens, I'm sorry, this sample group is dry or wet. I don't have to type that into text inputs, I've just got my drop down menu. With all of these, you can rename them. So sample choice input is maybe not the best name for it. So I could say like state of sample, is it dry or wet? Same with text inputs. We can come over here to the pencil. We can name it something different. So instead of sample text input, this would maybe be batch number or uh, batch, batch code. Um, something that is going to potentially describe the entire group. Same with the number, same with the notes. Anything that you put into the actual boxes in any of these four is going to be part of what is called the method default meaning that it will, it will automatically assign these values to your sample group. Um, typically what I do in here is I just rename these to things that are helpful to me. So I would call this uh, maybe a batch number, I would call this a batch name, uh, choice inputs, like I said, the state of my sample group. Um, but I won't typically put information actually into the boxes and I will wait to do that until I get to the test and I actually have my sample group there in front of me. Next is specimen. So specimen, like I said, this is an individual. So now we are working with individuals within my sample group. Individuals have things like a label. They also have a geometry. If all of your samples are going to have the exact same geometry, for example, they've been die cast or um, they've been cut using a machine that's very precise, you can type in the width, thickness, and length for each specimen. Uh, that will, like I said before, will become one of the method defaults and it'll, it will autofill those values into our test when we're actually testing these. If these values are going to change from specimen to specimen, as is often the case with research where we um, maybe created uneven samples and we, but we want to test them next to each other anyway, don't change these values because that is going to happen more in the test mode than it does in the method mode. You can see there's a whole drop down of geometries that we can use and it will give us different measurements on that geometry depending on what kind of thing we are testing. Um, I'm going to be testing a fairly irregular seeming sample, so if I wanted to put in the area and the length here, I would, uh, I'd be able to put those in. You can see I'm working in millimeters squared. Um, I can also work in meters squared and centimeters squared because I chose SI units. Um, if I wanted to change these to inches or feet or yards, um, then I would need to have selected all units or U.S. customary units at the beginning. On the left side, under specimen, we have the same four options as we had under sample. So this is now a specimen note as opposed to the sample note. You can see the pages look very, very similar. A specimen note pertains to an individual. So this would be something like um, this particular specimen was done in a batch that um, turned a weird color, so we don't expect it to look normal. Um, again, if you come over to these, uh, these little pencil icons, you can change the name of the note. We've also got number inputs, text inputs, and choice inputs choices being creating that drop-down menu of options. 
Um, the difference, it's commonly asked what the difference is between number and text inputs. Um, for people who don't have a lot of experience with uh, programming, it can seem like they're basically just both a place to put information. The difference with a number input is that you can do math with a number input. You can add number inputs together, you can subtract them, etc. So if I type the number 5 here, later in my test I will be able to use this number 5 uh, to define other things that would require a number input. Even if I type in a 5 in a text input, the computer does not recognize that as a number. It recognizes that as a character, uh, meaning that I cannot do math with this input. So that's a, a main difference between number and text inputs, is if you want to do math, you absolutely must use number inputs. Otherwise, text inputs and number inputs can function in very similar ways. So at this point, we've created sort of a uh, skeleton for how we want to refer to our sample group and how we want to refer to our individual specimens. Um, you can come back to these, obviously, later if you realize that there are parameters that you want to track that you have not adequately accounted for in creating this setup here. Next, we're going to move on to measurements within the method. So measurements, basically, are the information that the machine collects and hands to the software. So the most common of that information is the time that it takes to run the test, the displacement or the distance that our crosshead moves, and the force, which is what our load transducer reads. There are a couple of other measurements um, that usually don't really come into play here, but these three are the most common measurements. Under calculations, these are things that you can do with those measurements. So calculations would be something like area under the curve. The measurements are going to give us a nice graph. A calculation is the math that we can do with that information there. So this is, um, you can spend quite a bit of time in here figuring out what you want to do. For example, if I choose modulus right here, I'm going to bring that over to a modulus that's going to be run. Um, there are several, several ways to identify a modulus. And if you click over here to type, you can see there are a whole lot of different options to modulus. So I can do a tangent modulus, and I get different options on that based on the math that is required to identify a tangent modulus. Um, Young's or automatic Young's moduli are the most common, but there's any number of moduli that you can do. While this is a pretty significant list and we have nearly everything on here, there is an option to do a user calculation here. A user calculation will allow you to input your own uh, expression, basically, um, using any sorts of math, using any sorts of variables that we've got in here, and you'll notice specimen number inputs is one of them. So we can do math with specimen and sample number inputs, um, as well as things like the length of the sample, the final area of the sample, um, all of these can be used as variables in creating this kind of self-made calculation. Um, this is a lot faster than exporting your data to Excel and or MATLAB or Python and doing the math yourself. It just does require a little bit of learning to kind of fine tune and tweak these calculations. Um, another option under calculations, which we often don't use, but rounding rules. If your uh, group is particularly particular about significant figures and making sure you're not uh, reporting too long of numbers, you can set up rounding rules in here. Next, we're moving on to test control. Test control is all of the stuff that you probably initially thought about when you thought of us setting up a method. So this is going to be how to start the test, what kind of information we're gathering during the test, or how fast we're going during the test, and how the test is going to stop. 
We're going to start the test by the start button. We don't have any other options. Um, there are some sample or some uh, machine setups that have other options, but we start by the start button. Our strain is going to be measured by displacement, so that's the movement of the crosshead. We do have the option to um, attach an extensometer, and I showed you that in the cabinets. If you have an extensometer, you would want to let the machine or the software, sorry, you'd want to let the software know in measurements. You would have under here, uh, under physical measurements, you'd have something called strain one. That is the name of the extensometer. You'd tell it that that is a measurement that you want it to collect. You want it to collect information through the extensometer. Then when you come to test control, you'd be able to find the extensometer in the drop-down menu. Pre-test, um, temperature soak. We do not have a furnace or any way to control temperature, so that's not something that we have available to us. Preload will remove slack. Auto balance will automatically zero out or balance whatever measurements you choose, so things like displacement or force. And then pre-cycling will cycle between a couple of boundary points, um, sort of like a, a clown stretching on a balloon before it actually starts like working with the balloon. So pre-cycling would allow you to kind of add a cyclic proponent or component before you start your test. We don't work a lot with these, um, however, the most commonly used are going to be a preload or an auto balance. Next is test setting. We are going to tell it how fast we're going to move. Typically that is done by displacement where we give it millimeters per minute of a speed. Most ASTM standards are uh, defined in millimeters per minute or inches per minute. Um, so you've got a displacement controlled rate there are also force controlled rates, which is newtons or kilonewtons per minute, uh, meaning that you won't have a linear movement, but you will have a linear force. Uh, displacement though, most common. You do have the option to add a second ramp. That would be, say, we ramp up to a certain force at a certain speed, and then once we get to that secondary force, we're going to slow down or speed up our ramp. This, these last three right here will tell you how to change over from one to the other. So what this right here is saying is change over when the displacement measures a certain distance. Typically we just use one ramp. Finally is end of test. And we can have up to four different things that will end our test. If we have more than one selected, it will do whichever one trips first. So if any of these four trip, it would end the test. The default right here is that we've got a, if the force rate changes by 40% or more, um, that's a hard concept to really understand what exact measurements it's looking at, but it is looking at the force and if the rate of collection of data on the force changes significantly, it will automatically stop the test. This is fairly similar to what a break, a brittle break, would look like on a sample. Now this doesn't always trip, um, so you do want to keep an eye on the test. You also may want to put in a secondary end of test. I mentioned earlier that if you are chaining a whole bunch of fixtures together, you want to pay attention to what the weakest link in that chain might be. So typically what I will say, um, in addition to having this when the sample breaks kind of criteria, I also want to say end the test if we add, we put too much force. It's possible that my sample is stronger than the setup that I have created and I might not know that yet. So let's say if the force reaches 45 kilonewtons, um, it will stop the test for me. Uh, the reason I wrote 45 is because everything that I have attached right now is rated up to 50 kilonewtons, and I don't like to push the boundaries on something that could potentially break at very, very high forces. Um, having something like this will allow us to get close, but not go over the maximum rated load for my machine. You can also set up other end of tests as you see necessary. If for some reason this never trips or neither of these two ever trip, you can also stop the test manually if you must. 
The last one under test control is data. This is just how it's collecting data. It collects da a data point every 20 milliseconds and also every 0.13 kilonewtons. That's the default. There's really not any purpose to change this unless you are running very long, for example, uh, several hour long tests. Data points every 20 milliseconds is going to end up with a very, very large file. You may want to extend that a little bit to take larger steps and not have such a big file. Typically though, these default settings are just fine. Next onto console. The console is going to be the things that we see on the screen, as well as the stuff that we see on this little piece here um, on the instrument itself. So that's gonna control kind of what this screen looks like. Um, back to the software, we've got these live displays right here. Those are going to be these two up at the top. Right now we are seeing displacement and force. I could also add time because we're not actively running a test, the time counter is not working or not running, but I would be able to see length of time displayed during my test. You can see I've got a maximum number of columns at four, so I can't have any more than four on here, which is usually more than enough. Next is soft keys. We will have a couple of keys down at the bottom of my screen, and we can use these to select what those look like. Zero displacement is a very commonly used key, as well as return, which will return your crosshead to the position where zero displacement last occurred. You can also include balance all or balance the force right here. So that would zero the force before you start your test. Um, these kind of soft keys are things that you're going to want to do regularly on the machine. Next is frame. This will tell us how quickly we can move. The fastest we can go is 600 millimeters per minute. Uh, a typical kind of medium rate that we see with a lot of people is between 50 and 100 millimeters per minute. 600 is rather fast unless you are trying to test elastic materials. And then grips. There are some grips that relate to the software that kind of communicate back and forth. Ours do not do that, but if we had them, this would be where we could control those. Under workspace here, this is going to control what we see on the screen during the test. So this workspace is where I spend probably most of my time. All of this stuff, especially the sample specimen measurements and calculations, these four here was really setting up a skeleton so that we can define what our workspace will look like when we run the actual test. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what the operator will input at the beginning of each test. That would be things like the name of the sample group, things like uh, before I was talking about uh, batch name or batch number, um, as well as descriptions of the group of samples. The operator inputs will also include specimen information, like how thick each specimen is, um, you know, sizing or geometry on those. That also will include any of the choice inputs or drop-down menus that I created. So you'll remember, back under sample, I created a choice input, and I'm actually going to give it a different name, um, state of sample. So I created this choice input called state of sample. When I come over here to the workspace, if I go to sample choice input, since that was the information that I just put in, you'll see state of sample as an option that I can select. So the operator will be given this drop down menu that I created back here and will be allowed to select dry or wet when we start the test. Each test only applies to one spec or one sample group. So I will not be able to select dry and wet for each individual specimen. This is making the assumption that my entire group is either dry or wet. If I wanted to select that for each specimen, then I would have needed to create that under the specimen choice input. Um, so just by way of information, Anything you put under sample is going to apply to the entire test. 
Anything you put under specimen can be changed from individual to individual throughout the test. A pretty common one to put in, especially for our researchers who have irregular or not uniform samples, would be under specimen properties. Um, typically, you will do like length, witness, width, <laughs> length, thickness, and width. Um, I chose the, to do an irregular sample, so it's only giving me area and length. But you can also put in the specimen label uh, in here. So give it sort of a name, and then we'll say length is in there as well. Um, because that is going to change from specimen to specimen. If that wasn't going to change, then I could just come here to the method default. I could put that information in here and never have to deal with it on the workspace for the operator inputs. But these are things that may change between tests or between specimens that you're gonna to wanna to put in. An interesting thing that you can define is actually the rate of your test. So if you want to run certain specimens faster than others and certain specimens slower, you can define the rate of your test. Um, I've gone through this fairly quickly, but I do spend most of my time on this screen, going back and forth, making sure that I can properly identify each sample and specimen as is going to be most useful to me and whoever is going to be using the report to analyze um, our specimens. So I spend a lot of time here, and if I notice that like, hey, every one of my specimens has a barcode number, and I haven't given myself space to put in that barcode number, I'll jump back to specimen and give it maybe a number or a text input right here. And I would call this, instead of specimen text input, I would call this barcode. So I'll do a lot of back and forth, going back to specimen, that was a specimen text input, here's barcode, now I can add barcode on there. You can readjust the order of these as well by grabbing on to the end there, and you can drag it up and down, just like that. So I spend a lot of time making sure that my workspace and the things that it prompts me to put in are going to be useful to me in identifying my sample group, in identifying my specimens. Next, we'll move on to result one. This is a table. You have the option to show a table while you are testing of results or of inputs. So that would be things like your start date or your specimen number. You also can put in if you had any calculations such as, let's say break location or break we had here. Under the workspace in the results, we can give information about that break. So we can say what force was at that break, what energy was at that break. And this information, a lot of it will depend on what information you have put in about your specimen. Um, what time that break occurred, etc. cetera. Um, if, your, if the machine does not know anything about, um, you know, about the original length of your sample, then strain is not going to be something that it can accurately calculate. So you want to make sure that it has all of the data necessary for the calculations that you ask it to do. These results, most commonly, people will have the results table include the specimen label, any specimen properties that you put in. Um, sometimes they will have the rate if you're changing the rate. And then the results table can also include, like I said, any of the calculations that you have it creating, the modulus, the maximum, the minimum, etc. This results table can show up on our testing screen so we can look at it. You also can create a report at the end with these results in it. I'm going to skip over results two. Um, it has the exact same features as results one. So if you wanted to create two reports, one that is in US and one that is in metric units, you could have results one be one way, results two be another way. Um, you also could have results one be just information about the specimens and results two be the actual results of your testing. 
Um, this is just ways to have two tables that are slightly different. Next is graph. So this is going to be a graphical representation of the data. Um, the X and Y data, you can choose how that is shown. You can also show the number of curves per graph. You can change how the title, how the graph is titled. Um, you can show an average on the screen between your several specimens. So you can change how the graph looks, and you can have two different graphs as well. Raw data right here, by default, is going to be time, displacement, and force. If you have the correct sample geometry and information put into the software, it can also identify stress and strain for you. So you could add that to your um, raw data and have that export for you. Pass or fail will allow you to set pass and fail settings. That's going to be most useful if you're in a quality control setting, which we are not here. But there are ways to set up calculations to identify whether something has passed or failed. For more information on this bit, because not so many of our clients use it, go ahead and click on the question mark up here. Finally is layout. Our default is just fine for this one. Our default is to have operator inputs along the right side to have a graph in the top left, and to have the results in the bottom left. So this is going to show both a graphical and a tabular um, report or summary of the results. And then it's going to have our operator inputs uh, along the right side. And those operator inputs are all of the things that I asked it to input over here. Finally, we're gonna go to exports, and this is going to determine at the end of our test how we get the data. So you can specify a default folder. You can also specify a default name. However, this method could be used for multiple samples. You could use it um, for several days or several weeks um, or even longer. So often a default sample file name is not going to be particularly useful. However, uh, a default folder might be useful so that you know that it's always exporting to the correct location. Um, if you do put in a default sample file name, I would recommend adding the date and time to the sample name as is indicated here. Um, that way you'll be able to see the difference between the samples. Next is reports. So this is a PDF report that it's automatically going to export. This will have a picture of whatever graphs you collect and it will also have all of the uh, results table information for results number one. You'll remember there are two results files and two graph uh, options. It'll be results one and graph one will by default be on the report. If you want to change what the report looks like, there is a secondary tab here. Most of our users don't need any more than results one and graph one, um, so they don't typically mess with it. But there is a report tab here that I will go to quickly just to show you that you can set up kind of like the header, the body and the footer of this report to include whatever other information is going to be useful to you. Um, but it's going to save this in a PDF format and it will save that to the folder that you specify as your default. Finally, there's export file one and file two. The options between these, export file one is going to give you a kind of a bird's eye view of all of the results. It's going to give you the table one results um, and any statistics associated with the table. Um, and so that's going to be of all of your specimens. If you would like this, then set export file one frequency to at finish. If you do not want the bird's eye view, then you can just set it to on demand. For export file two, this is going to be the raw data. So this is going to give you an individual file for each specimen with the X and the Y values. If you want this, select to export at finish. If you do not want it, then leave it on demand. So file one and file two, um, you just wanna choose whether you're looking for a bird's eye view or just the raw data or both. Um, and whichever one or ones you want, set them to export at finish. Um, the last bit here is not something that we deal with much here, but it is a prompted test. 
A prompted test means that instead of allowing you to see the full screen and work with everything all at once, it will walk you through one thing at a time. This is really ideal if you have a, a lab technician who doesn't need to know all of this information and really doesn't need to set up any methods or deal with the depth of this software, but who you do want to send into the lab to just run things really quickly. So you can set this up as a prompted test. They would just go into the main menu, open up this method, and run it as a test, and it would give them dialog boxes and sort of walk them through, now load your sample, now click start, now put in these values. Um, so that can be helpful. Most of our users are a little more hands-on than that. If your head is spinning right now, don't worry about it. Rewatch this video as many times as it takes to really grasp what's going on here, as well as spend your time, uh, if you are willing to, you're welcome to come into the lab, click around on the software, and figure out kind of how everything works together. As I mentioned at the beginning, this software is very powerful, which makes it very difficult to learn, um, because there are truly infinite options um, as you set up different skeletons for different samples, and you really just want to learn what works best for your group or your project. So this will take some time to get comfortable with the flow of everything. If your head is spinning after the last little while of clicking through all of this as I talked you through it, don't worry about it. Um, just spend a little time, kind of keep going back, and um, you'll eventually figure it out. We have just created a method. We've set it up however we want it with all of the parameters and defaults that we wanted to set. So I'm going to click Save Method. This computer is connected to the internet, so on the drop down underneath computer, we've got the network. If you can't find the network underneath computer, that means it's not logged in, talk to staff to log in for you. If there are no staff present in the lab at the time, you can save this to the desktop. Just make sure that you create a folder called uh, temporary, as this group has done here, temporary right here. Um, so you can create a folder that is temporarily yours on the desktop. We will move it to the network when we're done. This network is available on any of the machines that have the internet. Underneath the network, we've got our Instron 5969. We've got the names of all the machines. Here's ours. Underneath user data, there is a list of all of the users on the machine you can create your own new folder to save to this location. I'm gonna see if I've got a folder. I'm gonna open up my folder, and we're gonna name this method. Now remember, this is just a method. This is not, um, this does not have any data associated with it, nor will it ever have data associated with it. This is just parameters that we can recall later. So I would save the parameters in whatever is the most useful. I would maybe call this tension with 10 millimeters per minute rate. Um, something that is going to allow me later to know what this method is. It might also be more useful to, um, to name it after something in your company. Say this is a um, you know, part B modulus testing. That might be a good name for this method since you will use this specifically for that purpose. So give it some sort of name that is useful to the method Remember, not a sample or a, a sample group name. Um, I already have a thing called training, so I'll call it training two and click save. At this point, I can go back to the main menu that is the end of method creation. If you have a method already set up on the Instron, or you have recently created a method, we can go straight into test. Test is going to ask us to either start a new sample or to continue a sample that already existed. If we are starting a new sample, you are going to look through the list of methods and you're going to grab yours. If you don't see your method here, you can find it under browse methods. It will, however, have the most recent methods available here, and that's gonna be, so training two was the one that I just created. 
So you can open that up. If you were in here just last week or just yesterday maybe even working on samples and they um, you didn't quite finish or you got a couple of more specimens that you want to add to your sample group, then you can come down here, you can open up a sample file and you can continue within that sample file. I'm going to open up a new sample because I have not yet tested anything that I want to continue off of. This is going to create a new file, and this new file is going to contain all of the specimens that I run under this particular method. So you can see I've got operator inputs here, state of sample, dry versus wet. This is a sample input, meaning I will not be able to change it between my first couple specimens and my last couple specimens. I do have a specimen label. That specimen label is going to be able to change between each specimen. Length can change between specimens, and rate can change between specimens. And barcode, I also set as a specimen text input, is what this one is, so that I can also change between specimens. Um, this is where it's really helpful to know the difference between a specimen and a sample so that you know what things you can change within this particular file and what things you will need to create a new file in order to change. So I've got number one, you can see it's just this solid rectangular bar here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load my sample into whatever grips or fixtures that I have attached and then um, I can put in my data here. With these particular grips that I have attached, they are, um, they are opened and closed by rotating these top pieces. So you can see as I open this up, this opens wider, so I'm gonna put my sample into here. Um, I'm definitely going to have to move my sample by messing with the console right here. So I'm, or I'm gonna have to move my fixture, I apologize, in order to fit my specimen into those grips. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna load something in there and then we'll come back. I now have a polymer dog bone loaded into my grips here. And what I had to do is I had to jog, it, jog the fixtures up and down in order to insert the dog bone with the correct length. Um, I also, I tightened down both the top and the bottom to make sure they were gripping firmly onto the dog phone. Um, one thing you want to make sure of as you're loading your sample is making sure that no force is reading. Often what you'll find is that the um, fixtures, when you put them on, are heavy enough to measure some sort of force through the transducer. To zero out the force, you just click on force and click balance. So I made sure that I was not reading the weight of the fixture as part of the force on the sample, since that is inaccurate. Also, since I moved the crosshead in order to fit the sample in between our two fixtures, you can see my displacement is reading 113.5 millimeters. That is not the distance that my sample has traveled. In fact, my sample has not traveled at all. So I'm going to click on displacement and click zero to set that as my zero location. So this is my starting or my you know, no movement location. Now from this point, when I click start, both my X and my Y axes will start at zero before they increase. Um, obviously time isn't reading since I haven't started the test yet, but I'm gonna put some information in about the state of my sample. So this is a dry sample. I'm going to name it dog bone one. Um, its length, uh, you can do some reading up on the internet about how to measure your particular sample. For dog bones, you tend to measure between the two smallest spots. So this is, we've got sort of an indent here and an outdent here where it's wider on the bottom and on the top and then thinner here in the middle. So I would measure from about here to about here as my length and then thickness and width I would measure as well along here. What I'm aiming to do for most, um, at least for tension, often also for compression, we're trying to get the cross-sectional area perpendicular to the motion of the machine, and we're also trying to get the original starting length 
parallel to the motion of the machine. So we have one measurement, which is kind of the, uh, the parallel measurement, and then we have the cross-sectional area that is the, um, the uh, perpendicular. Using both of those, we can get stress and strain from our force and our load. So I would put in my length. I did not measure this one, and seeing as it's a training, I'm not going to put in the effort to. I'm going to set my rate to be 10 millimeters per minute. That's not particularly fast, but it is um, kind of a, a decent rate. We'll be able to see it move. And then I can put in my barcode text. Um, this does not have any, so I'm just going to leave that blank. Make sure that you are wearing your safety glasses before we click start. Start can either happen on the bottom right hand of the screen here, or it can happen via the start button right here on the uh, console. So when I click start, you'll hear the Instron start to move. It does have a little bit of a squeak to it. Don't worry, that's not something truly problematic about the Instron. And you can see the data collecting on the screen here. So we are barely at half of a kilonewton. With a sample like this, I would recommend using the one kilonewton load cell um, rather than the 50 kilonewton. The 50 kilonewton is collecting just fine. This is kind of outside of the range of its, uh, its, its ability to collect really truly um, high quality, high resolution data. Um, so we've got a pretty nice like force started to be applied to it. And now it looks like it's holding pretty steady right here. Um, depending on my sample and the things that I know about my sample, I could either identify this as slipping in the machine, meaning that I haven't attached it properly, or this could truly be strain on my sample. Um, that is kind of up to me to know a little bit about how my sample should react under, under these physical circumstances, whether it's something that's going to break suddenly and forcefully, or whether it's something that's going to stretch slowly. I believe that what we are seeing here on the screen in the nice big long flat section here is probably stretching. I believe that due to the discoloration that we're starting to see toward the middle of the dog bone, where it's turned a much lighter white than the rest, I believe that is probably stretching of the dog bone itself. Um, since this is not quite as fun to watch, I'm going to hit stop and I'm going to say that we collected whatever information we wanted from that. Most commonly that would actually be a modulus and we have plenty of information here to get a nice strong beginning uh, modulus here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, well I guess first you can see on the right side of the screen that rectangle that we had next to number one now has a crack through it. So this rectangle, that means that it has been tested. So sample number one, or specimen, I apologize, specimen number one has been tested. Now specimen number two. I'm going to call this dog bone one, just like the other one, but I'm gonna call it faster. Um, and we are going to do a much faster rate at 100 millimeters per minute in the hope that it um, breaks for us. Um, I'm not going to zero out the displacement or the force because I haven't changed anything on the sample here. Um, normally you would want to make sure that the force is zero and the displacement is zero before you start the test. Once you've collected all of the results that you wish to get, we are going to work on exporting the results. First, what you're going to want to do is save the sample file itself. So we're going to click Save Sample or Save Sample As. Um, I haven't saved it yet, so for me, they both mean the same thing. But I'm going to go to User Data. Remember, that's under Computer. The Network. We go to the instrument that we are on and User Data. Then I'm going to scroll through. I'm going to find my name. Here's me and I'm going to save this sample file. So different from saving the method earlier, saving the method was just saving the set of parameters we had set up. Now this sample file has two results in it. 
um, one from my slow rate and one from my fast rate of uh, testing. And I'm gonna name this by the sample group. So that would be uh, a batch number or sometimes even just the date. So I'm gonna say eight, 28, 20. And save. So that's gonna save the sample file. And the sample file is something that you can reopen in Blue Hill Universal, which is the name of this software. It is not something that you'll be able to take home with you. By defining in exports, back when we were working with the method, you remember, in exports, by telling it what we wanted to export in file one and file two, um, by selecting them as at finish, I'm gonna save that again. When I click this finish flag, it will export all of the things that I wanted, whether that be the overview data, the, um, the raw data, whichever. It will also always export the PDF report of what I did. So I click that finish button. It's asking, do you want to start another new sample using the same set of test parameters? So it's basically saying, do you want to start a new sample file using the method that you were already using? I do not, so it's just gonna send me back to the home page here shortly. Oh, the test home page, I guess. Once um, I'm gonna go into this PC, the network, I'm gonna go to Instron user data, I'm gonna go to myself. Okay, so I will show you, based on date modified, the stuff that just saved. So we've got this IDTENS uh, file right here. That's not going to be anything that you need to read. That's something that Blue Hill Universal will be able to read. Um, we've got this Blue Hill Universal right here. This is our sample file. So that one has the data associated with it. And that's IS, TENS, I for Instron, S for sample, so this is a sample file and then tens for tension. We've got another file that is I M tens, I for instron, M for method, tens for tension. And then we've also got a CSV file right here. This is the results table. So we've got a CSV of the results table and the PDF of my tests, which I will open up to show you. Maybe, apparently not. Um, but you can see it here on our previewer. So it gave us the graph as well as the results that I set up in my uh, workspace options. There is also going to be a folder with the name of my sample file. Within this folder is the X and Y data for each of the two sample or each of the two specimens that I ran. So this is going to be considered your raw data here within this folder. And then we've got sort of the overview data up here. All of that information can be sent to yourself. This computer is attached or is connected to the internet. Um, once you are Done with all of this is going to be sample cleanup, which really just includes closing down the software, obviously cleaning up any mess that you've made with your samples. Some samples shatter uh, fairly brittily. We have a vacuum available to you. Please use it. Do not let um, our Instron get really dirty. And then take the fixtures off the machine to leave it back into its kind of raw base state with no fixtures attached. As a reminder, push your chairs back under the desk, throw away all used Kim wipes and gloves, and take your samples with you as you leave. Please also remember to not use any personal USB sticks in the lab computers. To save your results, if the computer is connected to the internet, open Google Chrome, go to gmail.com, and email the results to yourself using the lab account. If the lab account is logged out, please ask staff to log you in. If no staff are present, a personal account may be used. Please do not log out of the lab account. If the computer is not connected to the internet, find an MCL-owned USB 
usually a metallic blue color. Copy your data from the computer onto the USB. Then use any internet connected computer in the lab to email the data to yourself. Please do not put the MCL USBs into your personal computer. Once you have completed this training video, email lab staff at characterization.uofu at gmail.com to schedule a one hour follow up training session called an observation. Bring your sample to the MCL at the scheduled time and staff will watch and assist as needed for the first hour of your machine use. After you have successfully completed the observation hour, you are authorized to schedule time on this machine in the MCL for independent use.